Greetings Zimbabwe, Africa and the world. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, brought to you by Titan Law. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today we are discussing the recent human rights abuses in Zimbabwe with internationally respected human rights lawyer Beatrice Mtetwa and MDC Treasury General David Coulthard. Enjoy this instructive conversation. Beatrice Mtetwa, um, David Coulter, welcome to In Conversation with Trevor. You are the first people, by the way, to be featured twice on In Conversation with Trevor. I'm absolutely delighted to have you on board. Welcome to both of you. Uh, thank you, Trevor, although I feel a bit overexposed. <laughs> Welcome, David. Thanks, Trevor. It's a, a great honor to be with both of you this afternoon. Um, let me start by focusing, uh, Beatrice, first of all, on how the lockdown has affected your work and affected your, 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 your life, if you could uh, share uh, that with us. Uh, obviously, as uh, lawyers, it has affected us. We are not as uh, able as before to run to hotspots. We have restrictions at the courts in terms of uh, issuing process. And uh, like everyone else, we are affected in that we are not operating normally. So yes, lockdown has affected us, particularly where we have to act on an agent basis because lockdown has come with a lot of uh, violations here and there where normal rights uh, are not being respected as they ought to be in normal times. Mm. We'll get into that, um, uh, Beatrice, uh, which is exactly why we thought we should get together and have this conversation. Uh, David Coulter, how has the lockdown affected your personal life and your professional life? Well, of course, personally, uh, with family and friends, we, we've, like everyone else, uh, been cut off from, from people outside our nuclear family. Uh, in the law firm itself, uh, my law firm has been effectively shut to the public for six weeks, although we partially open now. Uh, and that has impacted our ability to do work uh, and to, to earn income. So the viability of our law firm has been uh, seriously affected. But as Beatrice has already said, uh, our main concern is how the lockdown has been used as cover uh, to implement a variety of laws which are unconstitutional and, and draconian, which has seen a, a limitation of, of people's fundamental rights. And um, there is a, a sense that in a number of jurisdictions, the lockdown across the world is being uh, challenged for a variety of reasons, for uh, impinging on people's rights, on people's uh, constitutional rights. What's your view of the way our lockdown has been implemented? Are there certain issues that you have clients coming to you to challenge, to challenge those issues? And what would those be? Beatrice, shall we start with you? Yeah. Okay, all right. Well, obviously, I mean, as you've said, there are basic rights that are affected by the lockdown. People can't exercise their normal freedom of movement. They can't earn a living as they would, uh, they would in normal times. And uh, we are in a jurisdiction where rights generally uh, are disregarded even during normal times. So you can imagine how with the lockdown, uh, a lot of law enforcement agents believe they now have license to do as they please and to completely disregard the fact that people still do have those constitutional rights that uh, uh, really cannot be taken away through statutory instruments uh, su su such as uh, we have seen. Uh, so clearly we have had to challenge some of these, uh, particularly uh, because uh, you can see that the government uh, didn't really think about some of the aspects of the lockdown that impinge on people's rights. And uh, where you have a right to earn a living and you are told you can't, uh, when you are able actually to take measures to, to curtail any transmission, 
if you are positive or to protect. Uh, really, that was not very well thought out in terms of the instruments that the government has, uh, has uh, issued so far. So somebody said, um, uh, Beatrice, that uh, if you were not a democracy before COVID-19, you can't be a democracy during the lockdown um, COVID-19. What's your comment on that? Well, I mean, that's a very apt way of putting it. As I said, we were struggling with the enjoying rights even before COVID-19. And COVID-19 has been a godsend for some people because it means they can trample right on rights. Uh, they can fast track certain things uh, that they want to do without due process because it is an emergency. And it's a very difficult balancing act for everybody because even for us as human rights lawyers, you do accept that uh, there has to be some limitations in so far as uh, the protection of life is concerned, but that limitation should not uh, uh, be such that people cannot earn a living and will end up dying of hunger or not being able to access medical facilities because they can't even reach the medical facilities. I mean, you listen to some of the stories of uh, people having to live with bodies in their homes for 24 hours because nobody wants to come and take a body even before anyone knows why the person died. Uh, the government didn't think through all of those issues clearly. Mm. David, on the challenges to the lockdown, um, and particularly within the Zimbabwean context, what are you seeing? What are your clients uncomfortable about? What is it that you've been asked to challenge? Well, I think uh, one of the major problems is that government has not consulted adequately, not just with the, the business community. For example, one of my complaints when the lockdown was first announced was that it was announced on a Friday night and was going to be implemented at midnight on, on Sunday. Now, businesses need more notice than that to, to make adjustments to their businesses, um, to, to make accommodation with banks and, and the like. And there wasn't that consultation. Uh, Beatrice has sp spoken about fundamental human rights. We've seen the police using um, this lockdown as, as cover to, to do all sorts of things that would be immediately exposed. The, the beating of two women, for example, in Bulawayo, and when I say beating, the severe assault of, of two, two women done under cover, those are all concerns. But I think, um, and coming to what Be Beatrice has said now, as human rights lawyers, we always have to to balance what the individual rights of, of citizens are against the, the need to protect the, the health of people. And my major concern, and it's a concern shared by some of my clients, has been, for example, the, the implementation of this decree that businesses um, must get their employees tested. Now, that runs against uh, WHO recommendations, what government has set out and has also gone against what um, the, the college, for example, the College of Public Health Physicians in Zimbabwe have, have recommended. They say th that this rapid uh, test that government wants each business to do uh, is only useful for research purposes. It has very little diagnostic benefit uh, because you can be tested one day and come out negative, but the next day you, you may contract the virus. Uh, and that doesn't seem to be thought through uh, by uh, government. Also, the cost of that, we've been told that these tests uh, cost in the region of between $1 and $9, and, and yes, and yet government is compelling businesses um, to pay up to 25, 26 US dollars. And one questions, who is making the profit given that, that massive margin? So these are some of the issues that we are looking at challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, is there anything you want to add, Beatrice, to, to what David has just said? Well, uh, it, it's quite obvious that uh, there are some elements uh, within uh, uh, the rulership who are looking at this as a business opportunity, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole issue of testing, that's government responsibility. Government should be testing the people, not asking uh, uh, struggling businesses, uh, struggling employers to, to, to do the, the testing. If you are a small uh, 
uh, uh, entity with maybe 10, 15 people, the kind of money they are asking for, and, and we don't know who these people are because there's no transparency as to how people actually get authorized to even do the test, which as David says, uh, are, are, are of no value whatsoever to anybody. It's mm. just a money-making exercise. And uh, really, as a country, we should be holding the government to account. You want to test us? Tell us where to come to be tested at government expense, especially because government has gone out to say, we need this assistance for purposes of curbing the virus. And part of curbing is testing your people and knowing who needs to, be, to, to take extra measures to ensure that there's no further transmission. And uh, you asking struggling businesses to do what they wouldn't be able to do anyway, even before the lockdown, at a time when they are not earning any, 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 any income. And in a, a currency that until a few weeks ago, we were told we could not even use. I haven't come across a single entity that is doing testing in, in, in Zim money. Mm -hmm. It's all US dollar based. Mm -hmm. And the majority of us do not earn US dollars. And let's be clear, David, my sense is that uh, worldwide, I mean, in the UK, in the US, um, the government is providing testing for free. Am I right? Is that the sense that you're getting or I'm, I'm, I don't have the right information? I, I think that you're absolutely right, Trevor. It's more than just a sense. Uh, even in South Africa, government is doing uh, the testing. They're picking up the cost of the testing mm -hmm. and they're achieving the economies of scale. But let me just raise one other point in that regard that we haven't discussed yet. Mm -hmm. And that's how irrational uh, aspects of this policy are. Let me give an example, and I'll bring Beatrice in. Both of us are senior partners of law firms, which have been shut down for five, six weeks. Our lawyers, our employees have all been working from, from home, and they've been protected. They haven't been exposed to the public. Now, we are required to test those employees uh, when they come back to work. And yet contrast that with the mining sector and with supermarkets, which have been open this entire period, uh, till operators have been in close proximity to members of the public for six weeks. They are not required to be tested in terms of this legislation. And one questions, where's the logic that businesses which have been shut down, whose employees have been relatively protected, are required to, to, to test, and yet those that have been opened are not. It, it's just illogical. Mm. Beatrice, you want to jump in there or are you, you're comfortable with what well, David has said? It's very definitely discriminatory in, in, in nature. And if you look at who is likely to, to have been exposed, as David says, those who've been open are more likely to, to, to have been exposed. Mm. There has been this absolute and total lack of uh, uh, you know trying to get other parties to be involved in this uh, government thinks that it is the only one that should make these decisions business doesn't get consulted or if it is consulted it is some business person in a manner that is not transparent certainly in our industry i do not believe that anyone has been uh, uh, consulted uh, to say what do you think is the way forward? But more particularly, if you look at the task force, it has been obvious that decisions are being made by non-professionals. Mm. The professionals have been sidelined, and therefore we make these decisions that are designed more really to make money for some people than to make the, the, the nation secure uh, from the virus. Mm. Beatrice, you, uh, let me come back to you. Um, you wrote this open letter uh, to President Mnangagwa, a very powerful letter. Um, take me through what went through your mind before you penned that letter. I was very closely involved with the abduction of Justina Mkoko. And uh, it, it is something that I thought we would never ever see where women are abducted and abused in the way that these young women were. And I was extremely angry that we had been told that this would never happen again under the new dispensation. 
And uh, when I wrote that letter, I was so angry that when I read it the next day, I had to read it all together because the anger was just so much. Mm. And uh, these are people, some of whom that I've really, you know, been in close contact with in the immediate past because they were being uh, oppressed like the rest of people in Zimbabwe and you would think that they would understand that if a person has committed a crime you take them through the due process of taking them to the courts you don't make them disappear and there can be no question that they were arrested by the police at a roadblock by uniformed police if someone tells you that they were not taken by state agents they'll just be lying to the nation they'll be saying to us we are therefore not free because people masquerading at roadblocks as police are not police. They are abductors and they're torturers. And for me, it has a very, very serious uh, knock-on effect on the fact that uh, if you run away from a roadblock because you don't know that it's genuine, you, you can be short hacked. And we don't see a sense in government of getting to the bottom of it. These are people's children, they are people's sisters, uh, girlfriends, wives, whatever. And when a government does not come out strongly to say, we are investigating this, the persons who are manning this roadblock have been arrested and they must tell us how people who in their custody disappeared and were thereafter abducted and uh, tortured. What this means is that none of us are, 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 are really safe at all. And it's this anger that we are not breaking from what has been happening in the past 40 years. Instead, we are escalating the torture and the violence, especially against vulnerable groups like uh, women. Mm. Beatrice, you were very specific. I mean, you were angry, but I think that letter uh, captured the anger of a lot of people out there. Um, you, you were very specific. You directed yourself to the to the to the uh, uh, the commissioner of police. You directed yourself to uh, the commander of uh, the national army. Um, speak to me about that. You know, we've had in the past two and a half years incidents where it is known that members of the defense forces who have committed atrocities, some in the public glare, and yet nothing has happened to the perpetrators. What this does is to encourage all other possible perpetrators because they know that they, 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 nothing is going to happen. Mm. So these are the persons who are actually supposed to provide cover for all of us. Mm. These are the persons who are supposed to make sure that Zimbabweans are secure from abductors and torturers. And, and there's complete silence from these people. Now, for as long as people believe there's impunity, for as long as members of uh, our armed forces, our security forces, our police uh, 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 service, for well, lack of a better word, because it is not a service, we will continue to have this. So we need citizens to say, no, the army, if anyone does what these other people have done in the past, they have to be brought to book mm. so that we don't have this continued culture of impunity when atrocities are actually perpetrated on innocent citizens. Mm. So th there you are, David, uh, a very strong re response from uh, Beatrice uh, in the open letter to the president following the abduction of uh, the MDC uh, politicians, Joanna Mamombe, um, MP for uh, Harare West, uh, Cecilia Chimbiri, uh, Youth Assembly Deputy Chairperson, Natai Marova, Vice Organizing Youth uh, Organizing Secretary. Speak to me, David, about your own reaction to this and where we go from here. Okay, Trevor, so my uh, reaction uh, comes from the fact that um, We've had a long history of abductions in, in our nation, uh, both pre-independence and, and post-independence. And, and my own professional experience, one of the first cases that I ever handled, Trevor, mm. in February 1983, was when a farmer came in to say that 
uh, that person's for, foreman had been uh, detained uh, by members of the 5th Brigade outside Sereni Mission uh, near Fig Tree in Madibiland and was never seen again. It was one of my first cases and I had to try and track that person down. And we never found that, that person. Um, so this is deeply embedded in, in my memory. And then, of course, I've, I've had personal experiences. Patrick Nabanyama, um, who was one of my polling agents on the 19th of June uh, 2000, was abducted by men in the presence of his wife and children from his home in Enketa, never seen again. Another close friend of mine, Paul Chizuzzi, who who worked so closely uh, with us in the Legal Resources Foundation in developing Breaking the Silence, abducted in February uh, 2012, uh, well, disappeared in 2012. We, we don't know whether he was abducted, but never seen again. And so we, we have a long history of this, and Beatrice has made the point of impunity. The reason it continues is because the people responsible for that way back in February 1983 have never been held to account. Likewise, the people responsible for Patrick and Paul's uh, abductions and disappearances have never been held to account. You have what happened to Justina. Um, but the worrying thing uh, in, in the past year is that we've seen uh, a, a return to, to this type of policy because since January 2019, we've had about, I think, 55 abductions. Most people haven't uh, disappeared uh, for good. I think only one person has disappeared and never been seen again. But it's a very worrying pattern and it's involved teachers. It has involved people like Peter Magombe, a, a doctor, professionals. And, and now these, these women have been abducted and, and brutalized. And two aspects of this, I, I think, should give rise to, to special concern. The first is that clearly they were handed over from the police to people. That means no one is safe because the police have the right to arrest people. You can't protect yourself as a civilian from the police arresting you. You can protect yourself if civilians try to abduct you. But if you uh, try to um, protect yourself from a, an otherwise lawful arrest by the police, you have no defense. And so you, you're putting yourselves in the hands of the police who are then handing you over to, to third forces. The, the, the second aspect that's worrying is the, the fact that these were young women and, and, were, and that they were sexually abused in the most horrendous way. And this marks a, a very worrying deterioration mm. in the human rights situation in, in this country. And, and that's why people like Beatrice, who are not involved in partisan politics, um, need to, to speak out. Mm. Uh, because this can get drowned in the partisan debate. And it, it's critically important that objective, um, apolitical people uh, speak out forcefully so that government gets the message that this will not be tolerated and, and must stop. David, an important point that you raise there, and that is that these three women were arrested by the police, uh, and the police did confirm that they were in their hands. And then uh, something happened in between. The police started denying that they ever had those people. But you raise a fundamental point. When the police arrest you, you cannot refuse to be arrested. Otherwise, that becomes a crime in itself. So you hand yourself over to the police, and then the police hand you over to people who you and I don't know. Well, exactly. And that's why this is such a, a serious deterioration in, in the human rights uh, situation in the country. And, and let me tell you, Trevor, that the international community has picked up on this. Uh, in the last week, to give you one example, I've had a series of co conversations with Helen Clark, the former Prime Minister of, of New Zealand. And she, she is outraged by this, not just because they uh, were women, but because everyone knows that in civilized societies, uh, the police are there primarily to protect people. They are there to uphold the law, um, not to put people into danger, and not to break the law so flagrantly and brazenly as, as happened in this case. Beatrice, what we gather is and, that- And Chesa, you, you can see that there's an, 
there's an attempted covering up. Mm -hmm. When you get the national police spokesman being told not to give information unless he has actually cleared it with the, the commissioner general, it becomes quite obvious that there are attempts at covering up because mm. there's no genuine, credible story to tell. Mm. And the only way to avoid what is a obvious a, a, a mess up by, by the, the, the security forces is to withhold information. I mean, in any country that claims to be a democracy, the police spokesman actually ought to be telling us how persons arrested by the police ended up somewhere in Bindura, uh, having been tortured, not to be told not to, to talk to us. And this, is, this for me is particularly painful because we were told that the new dispensation would do things differently from the, the, the Mugabe dispensation. And in particular, we have people in government who are subjected to this kind of thing by the previous regime, who now appear to be quite happy to have police who will abduct and torture with no, no consequence whatsoever thereafter. That is so worrying for me because it means we cannot trust the politicians out there. You know, we don't know whether when the MTC goes in, they'll do the same thing because it's become a culture. There's no openness. They are not accountable to anyone. A police spokesman who ought to be explaining to the nation has been told to shut up and only to speak when his boss tells him to speak. I mean, what sort of democracy is that? Yeah, it's, it's um, Beatrice, I'll stick with you there. The, the, so some, some of the gruesome details that we know, uh, Beatrice, is that these ladies were forced to drink their urine um guns were used to simulate sexual intercourse i mean that's shocking that's inhuman talk to me about that beatrice it's it's actually not new what is new is perhaps the gun i mean uh, in i think in 2000 or 2001 i dealt with a number of the election petitions and what they did to these women they actually did to a woman in Berengua uh, 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 during elections and her crime was that her, her husband was an MTC activist. And what they did was to use a log to simulate Me sexual sex. intercourse. So this is not the first time. It's happening. They're now using a gun, but it's, it's really the same thing. And they, continuing because this is something they've been doing for as long as we can remember in the past 40 years. And mm -hmm. the depravity gets worse because everybody knows that there'll be no, you know, consequences. You will not be held to account mm -hmm. by those who are supposed to. And that these are young women who have chosen to get into politics is also deliberate. Who are you to think that you can get into politics as a female? That is not where you are supposed to be. It's the wrath and tumble of men. And that's a very serious curtailment of rights because it means as a woman, I'll be afraid to get into politics because I don't want to, to be used uh, uh, in the manner that these young women may be abused. I don't want sexual intercourse stimulated using guns or laws. So clearly, this is a, a, a way of limiting participation of women in politics. Mm. And this is at a time when we have a constitution that actually says that whatever we do, we must make sure that there's proper gender representation. All our institutions must, must be gender represented. Uh, what you're going to see right now is, is, is the reduction of women wanting to participate in politics. Mm. Uh, especially the younger women. Zimbabwe is a very, very conservative society. A young woman who's been abducted and tortured in the manner that these young women were uh, becomes damaged goods. So if she's looking at getting married, for instance, they, there'll be very few takers. And in our culture, we don't talk about certain things. So sometimes you'll find that women will not even talk about what would have happened to them 
because they are not just embarrassed, but they don't want the perception that goes with the, the attitude that you ask for it by getting into politics. So it's not just the physical, emotional, and mental aspects of the torture. It is what it is going to do to our political uh, 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 space. It just means women are simply not going to participate. Wow, oh, that's, that's chilling, isn't it, David? Um, and, and these people that do this thing, David, continue to walk our streets. Uh, the impunity continues. I mean, I'll try a, a, a roll call of the victims of uh, state abductions. Uh, Rashu Eguja, Army Captain Edwin Inlea, Patrick Nabanyama, as you said, Jessina Mukoko, Tenderai Ndira, Itai Zamara. And uh, the shocking thing is that Jessina Mukoko uh, went to, to the court and eventually got paid. And she knows that the people that do this actually are still in the system and uh, that these people have, have actually been promoted. What kind of a society are we, David? Speak to me about that. Well, Trevor, I, I want to add one, before I answer your question, I want to add one additional dimension to this. We focused on the people who did the, abduct, the abductions and uh, who were responsible for, for the sexual abuse and harassment of, of these women. But there's another aspect to, the, to this, and that is what has happened after they've been discovered. And I don't want to focus so much on Energy Motori, who, who's lost office because of his outrageous comments, but let's focus uh, on, for example, the Minister of Justice's comments. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the comments of other government spokesmen who have not uh, accepted what these women have said, have brought into question what they've said, um, have, have challenged their credibility, uh, and in, in that as well, have undermined their, their integrity. I mean, these women would have to be world-class actors to have acted out uh, what they've said to, to, to people. Uh, doctors, independent doctors, have come and physically examined them. We also, uh, in other words, the point I'm making is that there are objective sources to, to point out that they are telling the truth. And yet, despite that, we have senior uh, government ministers, including the Minister of Justice, bringing their integrity into account and saying that they will be arrested before they've even spoken about how these very serious crimes are going to be investigated, they in, in, in turn, in, instead rather, threaten these women. Now, there's another story doing the rounds, and as you know, I'm in Bulawayo, so I don't know whether this is true or not. So I, I use the word uh, alleged, but there is this uh, allegation out there, and perhaps Beatrice can speak to this, that, that when the police started their investigation, they took photographs. Uh, of, of the woman, and these photographs have now been leaked into the public domain. Now, I don't know whether that's true or not, but if it is true, it's a further outrage. And what should be happening in, in this situation is that people, government in particular, should take these allegations seriously. What we would expect to, to see is an independent uh, investigation being set up. In, in which there are a good number of women involved so that we have gender balance in that investigation. But you cannot have the police investigating themselves. Here you have an allegation that police have allowed these women to be taken from police custody and then disappeared and tortured. How can you then have the police who are complicit in this investigating? What we should have is an international inquiry getting uh, an esteemed uh, judge from uh, you know, Kenya or Tanzania, Zambia, to come in here and investigate these allegations and to make recommendations, not just for the prosecution of those responsible for this, um, but also to make recommendations how we can stop this in future. And so I, I want us to shift from just focusing on, on the young men, presumably, who are following orders to do this, and shift responsibility to the very, the, the most senior echelons in, in government 
who have compounded this problem even more. Mm. And, 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 and in that, um, David, is if the denials from the government that they were not involved in this were accompanied by a determined investigation of wanting to find out who actually did this, one would have thought that the state does have the machinery to double down and ensure that these people are apprehended. What's your view to that? Well, exactly. And if we think of what's happened in the last 14 months or so, we've had 55 abductions in, in this country. The one consistent response from government is, has been that there's some sort of third force and there's been an allegation that the opposition somehow are involved in this. Now, the one thing that we know from this government is that they are not shy about arresting uh, opposition activists if they have the slightest hint of being re uh, responsible for, for crimes. And so one questions, if there is a third force, why have there been no investigation? Uh, why haven't there been any uh, arrests and prosecutions? Uh, but in any event, why have we not seen a thorough investigation of what happened to a person like uh, Peter Magombe mm. uh, and, and all the rest, the other 50 people? There's been absolute silence. And that all points to complicity by the state. On the issue of uh, the police going to take pictures of these women, yeah. uh, that is a fact. And as lawyers for human rights, we have formally written to the government to, to say, uh, how is it possible for police to say we are taking pictures as part of our investigations and they get the young women to take their photo? And then those very same pictures then end up in social media. I mean, that can only have come from the police. Mm. And I do not believe that some young constable would actually release those types of photographs without uh, uh, you know, the superiors uh, saying uh, that uh, that is okay. And if it does, without their authority, I would expect them to have been arrested by now because that's a very, very serious violation of the rights of these young women to just basic dignity. You know, you have uh, photographs you believe are being taken to assist in investigations and, and they end up in social media. What sort of country does that? You know, so as David says, I mean, this whole thing has been orchestrated from above. There is no state security agent, whether they're in CIO, whether they're in the army, whether they're in the police, who would have been able to go and take these women from police mm -hmm. custody without some okay of that by a senior officer. We know that all three organizations were in terms of very, very strict command structures uh, where you can't just do as you please uh, without your without your superiors okay in what you're doing. So there can be no question that this is traceable to the highest possible echelons of power. And uh, this is why nothing is being done. The women, instead of having someone investigate what happened to them, are now being harassed because they are deemed to be now the, the criminals. And, and which means that when these things happen to people in the future, People are even afraid to say what happened to them because they become their two persons instead of the complainants who ought to be treated by the state with absolute dignity, care, and, and empathy. We're not saying that. So the door where we should place all of these violations uh, is that at the highest office in the land. It, it does appear, um, just to that point, uh, Beatrice, that uh, there's, there's um, uh, grave indiscipline within the police force, uh, within certain sections of the military. And I will run down the number of cases that we've had. The uh, torture of uh, the uh, Secretary General of uh, the uh, Zimbabwe National um, Rural Teachers Union, um, uh, more blessing in Yambara. The chief in Gweru and two Bulawayo residents who've decided to sue the army and the police for uh, being brutalized during the lockdown. Uh, there are six rogue police officers 
who are being investigated in Bulawayo again for uh, brutalizing civilians. On the 16th of April, Noctula Mpofu and Tombizoto Mpofu were allegedly assaulted, and we saw the pictures of, of those people, and there was verbal abuse of a tribal nature. We have seen journalists being harassed and, and, and being detained uh, for simply doing their work. It's as if somebody said to these people, go out and, and be reckless, or there isn't a command structure. Talk to me about that, uh, um, uh, David and Beatrice. Okay, let me kick in. Trevor, this is the point I'm making, that uh, we need to realize, and I want to reinforce Beatrice's point. In, in one sense, th this does uh, denote rogue behavior, but, but actually we know that our security forces are highly disciplined. There is a command structure. And the command must have come somewhere, it come from somewhere. And, and it's been cons consistent for over a year now. And this points, I'm afraid, to, to the very top in, in government. Uh, ultimately, the buck has to stop somewhere, and it stops at the president's office. Uh, and the president, unfortunately, has been completely quiet in the last two weeks about this. We would have expected, citizens would expect, that a father and a grandfather uh, would be horrified by the abuse of of young women. Uh, imagine your daughter or, mm. you know, I've got mm. daughters and I've got granddaughter, granddaughters and the thought of them being abused like this, even if they belong to another political party to, to mine, is horrifying. It, it's, it's barbaric. And one, one would expect condemnation of this uh, from the very highest authority in the land. Unfortunately, the silence that has come from that office appears to, to indicate that these acts are condoned. And they will continue for so long as that highest office does not speak out and say enough is enough and this must stop. Um, and not yeah, just speak yeah. and say enough is enough. Actually, we need to see action where perpetrators are brought to account, where they are prosecuted. And where if you sue for damages, the state does not rush to pay for them. Because that also means actually you and me paid for Justina's abduction and torture. Because at the end of the day, the state settled and paid. So, you know, the taxpayer paid for some rogue uh, state security agents who were doing what they, exactly what they were not employed to do. And uh, for as long as there's no personal consequence to the perpetrators, however lowly they are, and whoever would have said it was okay for them to do what they were doing, we will continue to have this. So I think we need to find ways of not only just naming and shaming the individuals at the, at, at the end of the day, the, the, the young people who are abused to do this, uh, by the state, because I can't imagine that it, it would be enjoyable for any young uh, state security agent to do what they did to these young women. They are as much damaged uh, property as, 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 as their victims. And for as long as we will not shame them enough for them to say, I did it on instructions of foreign so we continue having it. And as a country, I think we should have a conversation on how can we stop this by making sure that there are proper investigations and those responsible are brought to book? Because as David says, the police are not going to investigate themselves. Uh, and we know that the police didn't do this because if the police were the ones doing it, they wouldn't have taken the young women to Central Fest. They would have abducted them from the roadblock and taken them wherever, but the fact that they were taken to the police station suggests that they were locally arrested by police, but mm -hmm. a stronger force came in and, and took them from the police, which is why the police are now being uh, uh, told not to speak on the incident. Mm -hmm. And until we find that way, unfortunately, although the constitution has a provision for these oversight institutions, at the end of the day, it's just the president who appoints people to those institutions. Even if we had a commission of inquiry, I mean, David will tell you how many commissions of, of inquiry we've had since the early 80s. 
and uh, none of them have, have resulted in anyone being held accountable. Instead, we have some that are still locked up uh, in the president's office, and uh, others where recommendations are simply not followed. But I think as a people, we must now find our own way of dealing with this problem without expecting the state, which is the perpetrator, to do anything about it. How would, how would that look like, uh, uh, Beatrice? We must have a conversation on how to stop this. Mm -hmm. How we do it should be the subject of that conversation because legally, you know, it's the president who can do some of these things. Mm -hmm. And if he's not doing it, uh, maybe we should then look at other ways of trying to ensure that those responsible are brought to book where we can uh, do private uh, prosecutions, we do them. Where we can sue people uh, in their personal capacities, we do it. Well, what's your response to that, David? Um, we take matters into our hands. We find uh, a way out of uh, dealing with these issues, as uh, Beatrice says. What's your response to that, David? Well, I want to come back to, uh, I gave you that historical example of the man abducted um, way back in February 1983. And that man's case came before the Chiambakwe Commission in January 1984. The, the late Michael Rett, um, in conjunction with Pius Ngube and, and Archbishop Carlin, eventually managed to find a skull. And it was before the, the time of DNA, but that Michael Rett actually brought the skull to the Chiambakwe Commission. Um, to, to demonstrate that this, this was a real person, um, a, a human being, a father, uh, to try and convey the message um, to, to that commission. And going forward, as you know, I believe in, in nonviolence and constitutionalism. I, I, I don't believe that we have any other options but to, to pursue those uh, principles. I think that what we've got to start doing is, uh, as Beatrice has said, said, to have more conversations like this one. And, and let me say this, Trevor, that in my mind, the soul of our nation is in serious trouble mm -hmm. at, at present. Um, when we can start dehumanizing people in the way that has happened in, in the last two weeks, we are in serious trouble. That, that's what happened in Nazi Germany when, when Jews were made to, to be second-class citizens. That's what happened under apartheid um, and, and in Rhodesia when, when, when black people were second-class citizens. That then gave license to um, policemen and, and soldiers to disrespect human life, to kill people randomly because they weren't valued as as human beings and we've now got to that point in in our nation where we can view people simply because they belong to another political party as an enemy an enemy of the state and the moment you start using that language is the moment that young impressionable men feel that they have absolute license uh, to do these um incredibly degrading things to, to women, to, to, to mothers, um, to, to people who could be, be their sisters. And, and we're in trouble. And, and that's where, to come back to, to Beatrice's letter, Beatrice's letter was so incredibly powerful mm -hmm. because she spoke as a mother more than as a human rights lawyer. And she spoke to people who she had... Uh, represented herself. She personalized it just to say, remember who I am. Remember that when you were in trouble, I stood up for you. And th I think that's the conversation that we've got to, we've got to have with Emerson Munangagwa mm -hmm. and uh, Auxilia Munangagwa to say, you're a mother. Mm -hmm. If that was your daughter, how would you feel? Mm -hmm. Is this not a time for some self-introspection? Are we really going to put partisan interests uh, so far ahead of every other principle? And until we have that very direct, um, searing, soul-searching uh, conversation with the senior people in government, this won't only continue, it, it will uh, continue to get worse.
because that's what we saw under apartheid. Uh, uh, that's what we saw under the Nazis, that, that they started off with Kristallnacht and just destroying uh, shop stores, but they ended up with concentration camps. And the same in South Africa, where there were petty indignities, but then you, you ended up with flat plas and, and people being poisoned on, on mass. And, and that's where we're headed if we don't stop this now. Let, let me just bring a matter that we need to deal with, which is when, when you say that they, you arrested them because they broke the law, they were protesting, and then you deal with them in the heavy-handed manner that you do, for me, it diminishes the importance of the alleged uh, initial crime that they committed. Do you want to come in on that, uh, Beatrice? Sorry, I didn't get part of your question, but I mean, it, it's quite obvious that uh, the threat to arrest them and take them to court is meant to stop them asserting their rights uh, with regards to the bigger issue of their abduction and torture. Mm. And uh, you can see that the government wants to do a trade-off of force or to weaken their, 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 their you know, rights in terms of what actually happened to them. The law is very clear. If you have committed a crime, you are arrested at a roadblock, you must be taken before a magistrate in terms of uh, that crime mm. within a given period of time. And that period of time is... 48 hours unless they are able to justify why it should be longer, but that should be divided by a magistrate. Mm. Nobody is saying people should not be arrested and prosecuted where they've committed crimes, but due process must be followed. And where it is quite clear that it is now being followed in order to cover up uh, 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 the serious atrocities that these young women suffered, uh, I think as a people, we should all say that the law, yes, it is said to be an us, but it should be used evenly. You know, when they go to court, they should want their case to be heard first. They did make complaints. Nobody has even taken one in court and uh, uh, proper statements from them. Uh, the, the government has done virtually nothing other than come and take pictures for purposes of violating them. And so there ought to be a very strict adherence to even-handedness in dealing with these uh, cases, uh, especially the bigger case of abducting and torture, because, uh, uh, you know, that's not just breaking lockdown. It, it, it is a very serious matter under international law and even under local law. So clearly my view is that when those women go to court, it should be a trial of their abductors not their trial, first and foremost. David, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, just a quick point, uh, Trevor, to say that it, if they were eventually uh, taken to court for violating the COVID-19 regulations, they didn't, um, I think by their own admission, practice social distancing. Any reasonable uh, magistrate at, at, at worst is going to give them a caution and discharge because that the magistrate will take into account the the amount of punishment that they have already endured mm -hmm. so it it's a waste of time and and entirely frivolous in my view to prosecute them now for an offense which which they will probably just get a caution and discharge and and the the state uh, attention and focus should be on these very grave crimes that have been uh, committed against them. In fact, these crimes are, are not just Zimbabwean crimes. They are international crimes. They are crimes against humanity. Hmm. Um, David and, and Beatrice, we have, it, it, let's set a context to this. And, and the context is the way we prosecuted the um, liberation struggle was a violent one. Gukura Wundi, 20,000 people killed, nobody brought to account. Murambatsina, a number of people killed. And I think in your book, David, you actually uh, postulated that more, maybe more people were actually killed uh, during Murambat than uh, during uh, Kukura Wundi. And you, we speak now about uh, this nation being in a very terrible place as far as a culture of human rights is concerned. And you're talking, David, now about we need to have the conversation 
to bring us back to the right space. How do we start that conversation? Who starts that conversation? Well, it's got to be multifaceted. Uh, no one has a monopoly over this uh, conversation. Um, what you're doing in this conversation, Trevor, is critically important. Um, professionals like you, the media generally, have to start the, the, the conversation. The, the churches need to be involved. Civic organizations need to be involved. We need a much stronger stance taken by the Law Society of Zimbabwe, which has been relatively mute. Uh, it has spoken out against this, but I, I would like to see delegations of professional bodies uh, asking for meetings with the president, asking for meetings with the commission of police, you know, demanding answers rather than just issuing statements. That we've, got, we, we've gone beyond um, the need for mere statements. We need action. And then, of course, the, the, the major political actors need to be involved. And the two political actors who got the most votes uh, overwhelmingly in the last election are Emerson Manangagwa and Nelson Chamisa. Clearly those two men should be speaking and their parties should, should be speaking to, to each other because th this is a disgrace to our nation. Um, it, it casts us in the worst possible uh, light internationally. And all of us who are patriots, who love this country, need to say, this simply has to end. Uh, and and the, the way to end it is by all serious patriots getting together to draw a line in the sand and, and to say, we will collectively now work in the national interests and re restore dignity to our nation and to ourselves. Beatrice, you want to add something on that? To that, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Trevor, yes. Um, you know, if you go onto social media, everybody has a say, but everybody expects the next person to do something about it. And it appears that we all think that it's actually the job of the opposition to deal with things like this. Uh, and, and it's unfortunate that actually this has happened to, to young women who are in the opposition. But actually, this is a problem for all of us. And uh, I, I don't know how we can get this conversation that will involve everybody in ensuring that these abductions and tortures and other human rights violations will only stop when we all say enough is enough. And this is deliberately done during lockdown because they know that very little can be done during lockdown by people. It's difficult for people to do anything. But it's a conversation that those of you in the media space should be really flagging out as being law of the David, um, Beatrice wrote a powerful letter which you, you have uh, acknowledged. I want to give you an opportunity now, David, to address the president directly. Um, because I think in my view, the fact that he has not said anything either says he condones this, uh, uh, or he ought to come out and say something strong. Please address yourself to the president in terms of what you'd want to see him do. The buck stops at the top. At the, at the top. It can, that cannot be escaped. Use this opportunity to do that, David. The, president is the, the presidency is the highest office in, in the land. The, the president is required to uphold the constitution of the country and and all the laws um, and the president is the father of of the nation and the best presidents throughout history have, have been the what i term the avuncular presidents those who could have been your uncle the abram lincoln's the nelson mandela's of of the world people who had a genuine concern for the downtrodden for uh, the, for the disadvantaged people. And the most disadvantaged people in, in our nation are young women. Uh, they have the, uh, the hardest obstacles to, to overcome. And as a father, as a grandfather, I would expect uh, Emerson Manangagwa to be deeply concerned about what has happened to these women. Uh, he should demonstrate that concern by, first of all, condemning what 
uh, has happened. And then he should appoint an international tribunal to investigate what has happened, uh, chaired by a person of the highest possible in integrity from, from Africa, a, a judge from elsewhere in Africa, and put in nonpartisan people, people who don't have any political uh, history in, in our nation. We've, we've got many people like that, church leaders and, and others who could sit on that panel and let them have a full investigation. And if they say that their allegations that these women uh, made this story up, then that will come out in that investigation. Uh, but if uh, their stories are, are correct, that will also come out and they will identify not just who did this, but where the instructions came. And then those recommendations should uh, be implemented by government. That is what um, Minister, Mr. Manangagwa needs to do and need, he needs to do urgently. One final comment. If he remains silent, if uh, his government's focus is to continue harassing these women, the person and the party which will be most damaged will be him and, and his party. Because the international community is watching what has happened. This has evoked the, the, the wrath of particularly women right across the, the, the world, but, but also you know, serious people like Helen Clark and, and others, people who are deeply respected in the, in the international community. And if they want to build bridges with the IMF and the World Bank to tackle the economy, they are going to have to tackle this issue because issues like this uh, cannot be avoided any longer in, the, in, in international discourse. So um, he has to act urgently uh, if, if he uh, wishes to end this and, and if he wishes to shore up his own political position. Beatrice, would you, have, would you have any other word to direct to the president regarding this matter? Well, I, 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 would, I would just also implore the men and women in ZANU PF and in government and say there must be men and women of integrity there. If the president does not do anything about this, you have the power in your central committee in all your other meetings to speak to the president and impress on him that the damage is not only to him, it is to all of you in the government and in the ruling party. And if you have integrity and if you care about the next generation, because in another 30 years, I'm not going to be here, but if I've been part of some atrocity, somebody might take it out of my child because I was there, I was in power. And, and if you want to avoid a continuation of these atrocities, you've got to act now so that we leave a legacy for our children and our grandchildren that will say, when this happened previously, this is what happened and you shall not do it again. So for the men and women in government and in vanity, you are as responsible for ensuring that the right things are done as is the president and you have the obligation to urge him to do something credible about it. Um, uh, parting short, David, are you hopeful about us being able as a society to stop this uh, impunity as far as uh, abuse of human rights is concerned as a society? Uh, I've always been this, an, a, an eternal optimist. I always believe that good will prevail over evil. It may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, but uh, if we start digging now, we might be able to, to really come up with uh, what needs to be done. Uh, so I am only hoping that uh, good will prevail at the end of the day. Thanks, Beatrice. Uh, David, do you want to jump in on that? Trevor, one of the reasons I love this country is um, because of the compassion that so many people have in, in this nation and the uh, amazing forgiveness shown uh, by people. I, I've experienced it myself. Uh, I as you know, I fought for Smith 
as, as a white. And in that way, it fought for the maintenance of white minority rule. For the last 37 years that I've been back in this country, I've experienced incredible compassion and forgiveness from black Zimbabweans. That goes to the very core of the character of, of Zimbabweans. And, uh, you know, the tragedy is that I think that a lot of people in government have done so many terrible things that they feel that they could never be forgiven, that there's no way forward. And so they've got to keep digging deeper and deeper into this. What I would say is that um, if, they, if they resolve to, to end this and to ask for the forgiveness of people, um, people will forgive and we can move on and heal our nation and move it forward. Thanks, David. I mean, let, uh, uh, we can't uh, finish off the show without me recommending to anybody who really cares about understanding why we are where we are. Um, that you should get a, this book and read it. Um, the Trevor Book Club uh, is about people who love reading this book. This is a, a tome, 647 pages, that tells the story of violence for UDI um, within the opposition in ZANU PF, Gukurawun, and everything else. Please do yourself a favor and get hold of this, of this book and, and read it. Uh, Beatrice um, Tetua, thank you so much for coming on to In Conversation with Trevor. Um, uh, David Coltet, I'm so grateful to both of you. It's a holiday today, but you created the time uh, to join us on in conversation with Trevor. Stay where you are and allow me to uh, thank you, thank our, our, our viewers uh, and listeners all across the, the globe, uh, in Africa, on the continent, in the diaspora, who follow this show. Thank you so much for watching this show. And to ensure that you don't miss out on any of our important conversations, I invite you to click onto this subscribe button so that every time we have a show as beautiful as this, you get an alert and you don't miss out. So thank you so much for watching in, in conversation with Trevor. Until next time, cheers.